Can I just read you something that I I, I, I was doing some uh, typing yesterday to to put a, a small ebook together, and I realised I'd written down, and you may have seen it this morning as I put it up. As you climb the mountain of life, the work gets harder. Perseverance, consistency alone will not get you there. What will is tenacity, drive, and the will to want to succeed. And I wrote that. It, it was in my book, actually. You know, my, the, the success of choice is yours. Uh, but I thought that at the moment is quite apt. Because if we've all got the will to want to succeed, we've all got the drive. And the five of us on here this morning wouldn't be here if we didn't want to succeed in one way or the other. Um, and some of the things I'm coming out of the government and coming from various things is that there are going to be more and more people who are going to be permanently working from home over the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's in one way, it's a blessing in disguise. It's, it's happened. It's sad that 30 odd thousand people have died. But I think it's shaken this country to the roots. And I think it's shaken it up. And of course, in my opinion, that's on top of Brexit as well. We are now going to have to face a tremendous possibility of backing Britain again, as we did in the 70s with the flags and backing Britain. Because unless we do back Britain and start manufacturing again, then we could go downhill. Epitaph, mm. whatever you want to call it, over. So has anybody got any good news they've had happen to them this week? Yeah, I've, uh, one of my clients has contacted me um, and she's, she's been looking at uh, buying another business to add on to her business. And I've been advising her about it and how to go about it. And uh, it looks like it's going to come off. Excellent. So, very good, very good. Mark, have you got anybody that's uh, jumped up and said, I want your expertise? We have had plenty of clients this week who have um, shown a level of appreciation for the, the claims they've been able to make. Um, this week was the, the starting point for the self-employed individuals. Yeah. So it was quite tricky, to be honest, because obviously HMRC prevented um, the accountants getting involved in doing the actual calculations or the submissions for the self-employed people. So there was a lot of hand-holding involved, a lot of guidance, but they managed to do it. My, all my clients aren't dim. They, uh, they have levels of intelligence and they did it themselves. And mm -hmm. Mark, have, yes. you, have you got any de a, a, a preceded information that you could let us have on this particular issue because Absolutely. yesterday yesterday i was on a networking and also len was on it as well uh, <coughs> and it was raised by one person but a couple of people spoke to me afterwards and said what do you know about it and mm. i would love to get it from excuse me saying this the horse's mouth not by a financial consultant absolutely i can send it to all you guys what i've been doing over the last how 20, since the 23rd of March is regularly sending uh, updates to all my clients, advising them of what the current situation is. And that includes uh, a full analysis in simple language of how these schemes operate. Well, I wouldn't mind being emailed into that if that's perfectly okay with you. Of course. But there's a lot of people who I feel are dipping out mm. because they don't seem to know about it. So if we could spread the word. Absolutely. But, but I'd like to spread the word from an accountant, as I said, not yes. a financial advisor. That's okay, that's great. Yes. Frank, anything yeah. happened to you? Sorry, go, on. go on, go on, sorry, sorry, go on. Um, yeah, there's, um, what is nice is, you know, you're corralled at home, so you're, you're not out and about and not really in contact with that many people, but still had um, work coming in across various service levels of the firm. Um, I've got a call to make to uh, a 19-year-old in Yorkshire 
who was referred to me by the owner of uh, a prestigious car leasing company. He deals with professional footballers, professional sports people based in Yorkshire. I did a job for him. Uh, we, we fought a speeding case in Bradford for him. Must now be four or five years ago. And never met him since. Um, he's done various things commercially with his business and used a local law firm, uh, which is fair enough. But he consistently sends me quality referrals for very, people very who good. are being prosecuted. No trumpet fanfare, doesn't want anything. I just get these guys saying, Mark told me to ring you. And, Excellent. you know, that's really nice. One yeah. job five years ago, and I still get work from it. That's excellent. Good, good morning, Vona. Good morning, Vona. Good morning. Sorry, I'm late. Good morning. Don't worry, don't morning. worry. Good Wayne, morning. Wayne, has anything happened to you that you want to jump from the rooftop at or sing to the angels? I'm looking at doing a bit of a mini workshop for some of my previous students. So, essentially, it's just looking at you know, seven additional ways, uh, although now there's 10, to increase their income, their visibility and the income. So that short presentation that I did the other day, we're looking yep. at online courses, masterminds, etc. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do that as a, uh, a four-hour mini workshop, two hours on Monday, two hours on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I put that out to, uh, to my list and I said, well, I can only take 20 people uh, because of the video, you know, on the side. And... Uh, I've now got over 40, so <laughs> uh, I've got to change it ever so slightly. Nobody can join with their video, but you know, whilst it's, uh, it's a free workshop that I'm giving to them, uh, it's, again, something that I can utilize in different ways. So I can, I can take snippets of that. I can put on YouTube. I can do it as marketing. Whilst I'm doing the workshop, I'm actually also upselling other services so Excellent. maybe they right. want to buy some of the online courses that's available. Good. Good. Uh, just, just actually on Monday, this will go live, but there's actually a mini course just on Zoom. So how to set it up, what package to, uh, to take, et cetera, et cetera. And it's only a tenner, like I said, the, the Zoom one really is just to, uh, you know, to help people to get a fame with the technology. We've been talking about it so much. Mm. But uh, yeah, you know, it, yep, it's great. nice to see there's a lot of people that are interested. Yeah. Well, keep us in touch with that that ten minute one with regard to the technology. I think if we could all have a look at that, it would be great. Me and my husband are building our a website for our affiliate marketing. We're going to build that and get content. So, yeah, we started on that on brilliant. building online properties. Brilliant, brilliant, make money. brilliant. This is it. Well, mm -hmm. last but not least, myself. Uh, Nothing spectacular, as Rona's just said, has happened to me, other than I am now getting one heck of a lot of people contacting me, asking for that little snippet of advice guidance that I used to get. And it is quite surprising how old, in terminology, I don't mean in, in, in age, uh, of some of these people. Some of them are really coming out of the woodwork from years gone by, which is giving me a kick up the backside and getting me into order again. Uh, which I'm desperately pleased about. Uh, and uh, people are wanting to go on to the networking that I'm doing on a Tuesday and Wednesday. And as I always say, if you're on a meeting for an hour and you pick up one gem, then that has been totally worth it. Okay, so what we're on it this morning is uh, Len is going to talk to us about franchising for about, what, 10 minutes, quarter of an hour. Uh, so can we pass the floor over to Len? Uh, so basically what I've done, uh, w when I do presentations like at, at the universities or whatever, they normally take about 45, 50 minutes and even that's not long enough. So I've just done an overview really uh, of what franchising is about because believe me, I, I, you know, I've been involved in it 30 odd years now and um, it's it's surprising how, how little people know about franchising in this country and, and what it's about. So 
just to give you an idea, there are, there are over 900 franchise brands in the UK, getting on for a thousand now, and um, they cover literally every sector, about 80 different sectors. Um, so there's franchises for, for everyone. Um, if you look at, at the definition of franchising, I, I've, over the years, I've looked, there's three basic definitions, one by the British Franchise Association, which um, if I read it out to you, probably take me half of, of my talk today. Um, it's that long. And the business dictionary definition and the Oxford dictionary definition and so on. To put it simply, um, you know, franchising is where one party, the franchisor, allows another party, the franchisee, uh, to, to operate copies and clones of a business model um, that has been developed by the franchisor. And they do that in exchange for ongoing fees, obviously, um, which I'll touch on. Uh, franchisees generally will be given an exclusive territory, not always. Um, you know, uh, some, some uh, brands, because of the nature of the brand, um, you know, there's one, in fact, yes, yesterday, International Coaching Academy, I don't think you mind me saying this, um, John doesn't uh, allocate out uh, specific territories. Because if you think about it, if you're working as a franchise consultant for a brand like that, and you've got, con you live in Liverpool, but you've got contacts in the Midlands or London, who want to use you, then, uh, then fine, they, they can do that. Whereas if they had a defined territory, um, which is suitable for a lot of franchises, then they wouldn't. So most of them do give exclusive territories. It's normally for a defined period, usually five years. Uh, very often if there's property involved, so for, for restaurants and so on, mainly because of the leases, they give a 10 year franchise agreement, not a five year agreement. And usually there's a, there's a break clause after five years. So it's, it's, it's a, a relatively, you know, long-term arrangement, if you like. Um, basically, what a franchisor does, if, you know, when a company franchises business, he needs to do it effectively. He needs to op operate the business in accordance with the systems. And... Where, where some of them go wrong is that they, they, they try to rush into it and do it too quickly. But basically, the franchisor gives the franchisee a system to operate. Classic example is McDonald's. You know, if you look at McDonald's, they're the same everywhere you go in the country. It doesn't matter where you go. It's the same food. They have to stay the same things and they, they serve you in the same way and so on. Believe me, McDonald's weren't like that in the early days. You know, they got chopped and changed like every other franchise does because people want to change things and do things differently. But ineffectively, what <coughs> franchising, the type of franchising we're talking about is, is what we call uh, business format franchising. So you're actually given the format and that is what you should stick to and, and that is the rules. Most franchises will charge a franchise fee and again, that varies tremendously you know, literally from a couple of grand up to, you know, a few hundred thousand for some of the big sort of, if you look at any time fitness franchise and things like that, you're talking a couple of hundred grand. Um, so they do vary tremendously. Likewise, with the ongoing fees, you know, in the old days, it was always classed as a royalty, which is a percentage of turnover or a percentage of profit. A lot of companies still do that. Um, and again, it, it can vary from literally as low as 5% to turnover or 5% of profit up to 20% of profit, depending on the type of business and the industry that you're in. Um, a lot of companies now have gone away from that method because if you think about it, if you're charging a percentage of profit or turnover, further down the line, you're probably penalizing your best performers. And that, that causes you know, conflict. You know, we, we call it the uh, the teenager. You know, they get to the teenage stage after three years, and they start complaining and saying, "I'm the best franchise, and I'm paying more than anybody else." You know, why should I? So some companies cap it; they cap the, that percentage. Other companies have gone away from the percentage, and they charge a set figure every month. So it'll be X amount every month. If your turnover goes up to such a thing, that your know, your set figure goes up every month. 
But then at least from a franchise all point of view, you know you're getting the same uh, same money coming in every month. Another reason for that is if you look at not as much these days, but I've seen it happen several times. Um, in fact, I was over in Dublin and it, and it was, <laughs> I, I was just amazed that this company didn't realize uh, what they were doing. And basically it was a, it was a sort of cafe type franchise. And um, when I said to them, have you not got um, an EPOS system? He looked at me and nearly shrunk. He, went, he was like, mm, yeah, well, we are going to put one in. And the franchisee had literally been taking cash over the counter, pocketing the cash, not putting it through the books. And, you know, obviously the franchise all loses out if he's charging a percentage. So there, there are various ways of looking at it. A franchise or when you franchise your business, you, you, franch, you, you become a different person or you, you've got different responsibilities. So uh, it's not just about running your own business anymore. You know, it's about uh, recruiting and, and recruiting is one of the most important things is recruiting the right people. There are franchises out there, literally, will just take your money off you. Don't care what you like, what you are, if you want it, they'll take your money off you and take you on board. Not the best way of doing it because if you get a bad franchisee, then it affects the rest of you, your network and recruiting further along the line. But some still do it. You know, it's just about the money and taking the cash. Uh, ideally, you need to recruit the right type of person. Over the years, I've turned people away. I said, sorry, but you're not right for this business. Uh, I don't care how much money you've got. Um, and, but it does happen. And it's same in the reverse aspect of that. You know, I can give you a classic example of a guy I met at a business meeting in Manchester. And he said to me, after I'd done a little bit of a talk about recruitment, he said, I wish I'd met you two years ago. And I said, why? He said, I bought this franchise. I'm not happy with it. Now, when I checked it, there was nothing wrong with the franchise at all. It was, it was a perfectly good franchise, good reputation in the industry, but it wasn't right for him. So he'd chosen the wrong franchise. So again, when it comes to buying a franchise from a franchise e point of view, you've got to look at all the pros and cons and so on. You know, it's okay saying, well, I'm going to manage it and I'm going to put a manager in, you know, over the weekend or whatever. What happens if the manager goes off sick and you want to get dragged in every weekend? It, it, you know, think little things like that. It, it sounds daft, but, you know, you'd be amazed how many people buy the wrong type of franchise. Um, so the franchise all, it, it, it become, once you franchise your business, it becomes a different business. You, you've got to train people. You've got to provide uh, initial training, ongoing training. You've got to monitor the performance. You've got to motivate your franchisees. You know, so it's not just about running your own little business. It's about, you know, uh, helping other people to run the business. From a franchisee perspective, um, ideally a franchisee should totally abide by the rules, by the system. As I said with McDonald's, it's, you know, you know exactly what you're getting when you walk through the door. But with a lot of franchisees, they come on board and they want to do their own thing. They want to change it. If you go back to the history of McDonald's, it was just the same with McDonald's. You know, you have people saying, can I do this? Can I sell this? Can I, you know, can I do it this way, not that way? So you've got that challenge of, um, of how you control that. And, but the franchisee, ideally, he should work by the system, stick by the system, protect the brand, develop the brand, um, and, and stay loyal to the franchisee. Doesn't always work like that. <laughs> um, the, the key, you know, which is, if, that's why I call my books the keys. Uh, the key to successful franchising is that relationship between the franchisee and the franchisor. You know, you can have as many franchise agreements as you want, but the key is that relationship. If you've got a relationship where you can work together, you can talk to each other, you know, going back to what I said before about franchisees wanting to change things, look at it from the other point of view. If, if a franchisee says, well, can we try this? A good franchisor will say, well, we've tried that, it doesn't work. Or, that's not a bad idea. 
let's try it in your area and we'll see if it works. And if it works, we'll spread it across the network and let the other franchises do it. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, how can I say, working together in a franchise. If you look at the advantages of franchising a business, you've got lower capital investment, because you think about it, um, if you decide to open branches up across the UK, you know, it's going to cost you a lot of money and it's going to cost you a lot of time. Whereas in a franchise network, it's the franchisee that bears the brunt of the cost, most of the cost. If you get the right people on board, you've got motivated franchisees, motivated people who, who like you, want to earn some money from something they enjoy doing. You're going to grow quicker. If you put an advert on Franchise Direct and get loads of inquiries, you'll get franchisees across the country quicker than you will open up branches across the country. You'll get people with local knowledge. So, you know, as much as we all, it might be the same business, the way it operates in London and the way the people are in London might be totally different from the people in Liverpool, which I'm sure you appreciate. Increases the brand awareness, obviously, and it increases revenue and profits. It also minimizes the growth risk. You know, if, if you join a franchise network and it's successful, it will grow quickly and grow profitably. So there's a lot less risk involved in growing a franchise network than in this in the other kind of branch network. And at the end of the day, <coughs> you should increase your capital value of the business. The disadvantages, there are upfront costs and a lot of prospective franchisors um, sort of tend not to take much notice of that. You know, if they use a franchise consultant to show them how to franchise the business and go through it all, it's going to cost them the best part of 10, 12 grand. If they use the highest one in the, in the industry, it's going to cost them 30 grand. It costs three to five grand just to do a franchise agreement. And all those are costs that have to be done before you start recruiting. Then when you start recruiting, you need to go on franchise recruitment websites, which cost anything from three to five grand a year. You know, so there is an upfront cost before you start recruiting franchisees. And a lot of companies, you know, they look at it and think, oh, I'll franchise my business, you know, get some job, charge them 10 grand a franchise and we'll be laughing. We're back in profit. Don't work like that, sorry. Um, so <clears throat> upfront cost is one of the downsides uh, less control over franchisees, um, you, you know, you're, all, you're dealing with people at the end of the day and even though your franchise agreement states this is how it's done and the operations manual says this is how it's done, franchisees are going to do their own thing, chop and change things. So, same with innovation challenges, a, a new franchise, a franchise owner might say, well, I want to introduce this into the business. If the franchisee says, no, I don't want that, then you've got a problem. So, there are advantages and disadvantages. Conscious of time, so I'll tell you quickly what I ask. I ask five questions if somebody comes to me and says, I'm looking at franchising my business. Those five questions are dead simple. First of all, is your business successful? And by that, I mean, is it well known both in the sector that you're working in and the geographical area that you're working in? Yeah? And most people say, yeah. Can your business be replicated? Now, most businesses that can operate a branch network can be franchised. So again, most people will say yes to that. Is your business profitable? And I've touched on that just before. The reason I ask that is because if it's not profitable, then it's, you can't really franchise it. You know, which brings me on to the third one. How profitable is your business? If you look at, you know, a franchise operation the franchisee in most cases majority cases takes the biggest percentage of the turnover or the profit so for instance subway charge something like five percent of turnover and they have a two and a half percent marketing fee and two and a half percent something else so the franchisee gets 90 percent subway get 10 percent roughly and that varies from franchise to franchise but it's got to be profitable enough for both parties to be worthwhile doing. It's got to be profitable for the franchisee to earn good living, at least the annual minimum wage. 
and it's got to be profitable enough for the franchisor to do it in the first place, because otherwise it's pointless franchising it, pointless doing it, if they aren't going to build a big network and, and make profit from it. And the last one is, is a very personal one. Are you prepared to give up a certain amount of control over the business that you've passionately developed over the last three or four years or whatever it is? Because at the end of the day, you're dealing with people and people will want to change. They want to do it their way. No matter how many franchise agreements you've got, they will want to change it and do it their way and try different things. If you're a total control freak, then believe me, your franchise is not for you. End of story. Once somebody says, yeah, I'm okay with those five questions and I'm happy with them and they want to go ahead and I'm going to end with this, I ask them six questions to go away and think about these six questions before we start. What are you trying to achieve? What is your ultimate goal? Why do you want to achieve it? What are your motives? When do you want to start an exit? Now the exit says very often people say to me, well, I'm not even started yet. I don't care. You need an exit strategy. Yeah. How are you going to achieve it? Where do you want to be in the next five years, the next 10 years? And who is going to help you along the way? And those are the six questions that I ask them to go away and come back with the answers before we start working with them. Then, could you, those five and six questions, Yeah. could you jot them down and let us have them? Because they're very interesting questions. And they're not only pertinent in franchising, Absolutely. They're pertinent in business. Absolutely. Uh, so that would be good. Okay. I've got no question at the moment. I'll pass out to somebody else. Len, I think we talked once before about clients we had years ago who had a Coffee Republic franchise. When Coffee Republic, I think, had already gone into administration uh, or, or it was going in and it was struggling. And a lot of people were pulling out of their franchises. Now, it was far too complex and clever for me to deal with. But I, they were my contacts. And I did look at the papers and then gave it to a much cleverer person in, in the firm than me. And it was a horrendous agreement. I mean, it was the size of a phone book. Um, and they promised the earth in terms of marketing and training uh, and, and hadn't really delivered. Um, and I think from memory, their share of turnover was quite considerable. I mean, I couldn't believe how, how much they were taking. So your questions, if you'd put them to the two clients we had from the franchisee point of view, um, I think you'd have been advising these two guys who'd never done anything like this before to run for the hills. Now, what I never understood, and it may differ, <coughs> you know, they had um, on the, it was on exchange flags in Liverpool, and they had external signage, internal signage and branding and menus and, and crockery and everything was all Coffee Republic. In terms of the startup cost, who normally would pay for that because it must be quite significant would that be the franchisor as part of the deal or is it the franchisee who is told you know like it would be in the case of, of mcdonald's or or coffee republic is told probably well these are the design guidelines you've got to use for signage they may even be told here's the sign maker that you must use and there's the cost so would that fall on the franchisee? Yes. Um, with nearly all franchise models, no matter what they are, McDonald's downwards, um, you, you're buying a business format franchise. So you should be saying to them, you, you know, the sign outside is exactly the same. You get it from this supplier. Your food is exactly the same. You get it from this supplier. Um, no, no matter what business it is, um, you know, it, it's, you know, it, it, that's, a, that's the sort of ruling. You, you're giving them a model and saying, that is the model, that's how it works, that's what it's going to look like. These are your suppliers, you know, this is where you can get your business from. 
And again, I can give you examples of franchisees who have gone and bought stuff from other suppliers, you know, because they could get it cheaper or something. And, you know, the franchise always take them to court because they've gone against the franchise agreement. So, yeah. And, and going back to your original point that you made, I think, most franchise agreements are that thick, you know. And if you look at them, and this is what a lot of people buying a franchise don't, they don't realize. Um, and to, to be honest, you know, again, you've touched on the point, you'd be quite honest, a lot of solicitors don't either. You know, if, if you look at a franchise agreement, 90% is in favor of the franchise or mm. no question whatsoever. You know, if you look at the obligations for the franchise or it's about that long. If you look at the obligations for the franchisee, it's about 10 pages, you know, and if it's done properly by a franchise solicitor, every single clause in that agreement is there to protect the franchise all effectively because it's his brand, it's their brand, it is or their brand, whatever. It's their brand and they built that business up from scratch. So they're protecting their own brand. In fairness, you know, good franchisors will, will adapt and, and they'll, they'll put clauses in to cover franchisees from certain things and, and, and different things. And, and as, as I've said, different franchises are different. Some will give them the right to buy from different suppliers, others won't. Um, but it, it, the agreement is so critical. And this is why when it, it's changed a little bit over the last 10 years or so, but if a franchisee took a, took a franchise or to court before, 99 times out of 100, the franchise will win every time. No question about it. Because they just look at the agreement. Sorry, it's in the agreement. You know, you're not supposed to do this. You've been in breach of your agreement. Boom, you're gone. You know, and it, it, it's, it, it has, there, there have been a few cases where franchisees have, have won cases. Uh, but would, very would, the, would the courts now look at a franchise agreement and even though it's, it's a signed contract, would courts intervene and say in favour of the franchisee that parts of the contract are so onerous as to be unreasonable and therefore unenforceable? Because you can get that with restrictive covenants in a, in a contract of employment. Yeah, <clears throat> within franchising, it's very rare. Um, Again, probably an example is, is most agreements will have a clause in the agreement saying, let's say you're working in the, um, in the courier industry, you know, deliveries. Uh, there'll be a clause in there saying you're not supposed to work in the, in the courier industry or work for any um, um, uh, opposition or whatever um, for the next 12 months. Now, previously, previous years, that would be, that would be held up very much so, which would, the franchisee wouldn't be able to work in that industry, simple as that. If he left? If he left, yeah. Yeah. 12 months. Yeah. Uh, and same if the contract was agreed, you know, finished up five years, he decided not to renew it, yeah. Nowadays, the courts tend to come down in term, in, on the side of the franchisee in those cases. And the reason is they look at it and go, well, that's his living. That's all he's doing, mm -hmm. you know. So they will come down into in, in, yeah. in, in those cases. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Well, there's one, one other thing that always fascinated me. I mean, because doing that does interest me. And, and what you're saying about the startup cost for the franchisee is, is, is really interesting because starting up any business has a startup cost. And it just seems to me that if you're acquiring a franchise, you've got the, the franchise fee, you've got all the add-ons, signage, marketing, etc. You've got legal fees probably at a higher level than you would for starting your own business. And then you've sold part of your soul to the devil, the franchisor, uh, uh, and, you know, the pound of flesh um, has to go every month or whatever. And, and a classic case is, you know, I haven't been to West Kirby since this nonsense started, but the old post office, which became part of the Roe Empire, they pulled out when the lease renewal came up. 
and um, I think the landlords, whoever they are, already knew that Starbucks were interested. Now, West Kirby has ample, independent, very good coffee bar, cafes, delicatessen type places, which, which I support uh, yeah. because I'm always in favor of the, the independent. And I, uh, because a lot of the produce is homemade, you know, that appeals to me rather than the steamroller of Capinero and Starbucks and, and all these people. But Starbucks opened in West Kirby and somebody presumably has bought that franchise um, and their startup costs must have been really considerable. And it's interesting that somebody would say, yeah, I think that's economically viable and I think I'll do better with a Starbucks banner against the independents in West Kirby. Personally, um, I've never been in it and, and positively make the choice never to go in it because I'd rather support the independent. But it's a fascinating choice, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, a, Star a Starbucks franchise, uh, I mean, I remember somebody once telling me a McDonald's franchise was something like quarter of a million. This. You know, it's frightening. I, I, said, I said to my son one day, my son worked for me for 10 years, so he, he knows quite a bit about franchising. And I said to him one day, <clears throat> um, he'd been in his late 20s, I think, then, but I said to him, have you seen this article? You know, if you buy if you buy three McDonald's, you're guaranteed to be a millionaire in about four years. I can't remember the exact details. And he said, "Yeah, but why would you, Dad? It's going to cost you quarter of a million to buy one. <laughs> if you've got quarter of a million, why go and buy a bloody McDonald's?" Yeah, and that was it. But you think about it, and mm. going back to your Starbucks, it's I'm like you. I support local businesses. Always have done. Always will do. But the minute people see a Starbucks, mm. they're in there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. It, it's, it's, um, you know, we, we had one, what's the, um, I can't think of the other, on the ice street in Newton the Willis, right opposite my office. And when, when they were opening up, I was like, oh, people around here won't go in there. Bloody <laughs> hell, you've got kids going in for the breakfast on the way to school, you know. <laughs> and it, it's, it's just the brand name, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, my, my thoughts on it, uh, I mean, you know, it, it is strange. I, I've got, um, he's not a client of mine, but I've had a conversation, met him and, and he's a good guy. He's got 26 Costa coffees, 26, you know. And I mean, you think, why? You know, yeah, I, I, I know somebody who's got a lot of them in Liverpool, mm -hmm. maybe this, the same guy. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly <laughs> double figures. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Any other questions? Mark, I'm sure you must have some interest in franchising or some clients who do. Um, oddly, oddly enough, we, we actually don't have any franchises as clients. Um, and I've never, never actually ever got involved in them. I've never had a client approach me with, with real, um, a real intent of getting involved in franchising. I've had clients say um, sort of half-heartedly make comments to me about one day I might franchise this idea. But you, you look at them and you think, well, that's never going to happen because the, the, concept, <laughs> the concept is just not going to work within the franchise, um, within franchising. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was really interesting to hear both what Frank and Len said um, over the last 20 minutes or so. Um, Len, your, your comment about the six questions that you ask is something that we do regularly with, with clients um, to try and identify actually what their aspirations and their goals are to see how you can assist them actually achieving that, whether it be from uh, development of the business or from pure tax planning. But, it, but it's amazing how many people actually do not, do not think about it whatsoever. You know, no. Where do you want to be in five years' time or 10 years? When do you want to retire? Yeah. And how are you going to get there? Because they have no idea how they're going to get there. Um, 
and a comment that Frank made, and, and it's what you've said about West Kirby is very, very similar to Birkdale Village, uh, where I live. Um, there are lots of delicatessens, lots of independent shops, and about maybe 18 months ago, Costa Coffee appeared. And it's not particularly busy because of the vast majority of people want to support the, the local independents. And I, I suppose from that, a question to you, Len, would be when someone comes along um, and let's say it's a Costa Coffee, do, does the franchisor actually come along and assess the location, the locality and say, mm -mm, you're not putting one there? Or do they just say, don't care where you put it, you give us the money. Uh, you make the money, we'll take it off you, we don't care. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I nearly touched on it before. <laughs> if, you, if you look at the, the classic difference is, is McDonald's and Subway, right? Subway have now overtaken McDonald's in terms of numbers of outlets, right? Mm. And the reason is simple. McDonald's will only go in areas that they've analysed and they've looked at and they've decided that there's enough business there for their business. It will not go in secondary locations, right? Subway will go anywhere. They'll stick it on the side of a garage, they'll stick it on an ice cream, they'll stick it anywhere you want, in the university, you name it, they'll stick it anywhere, yeah. right? And if you look at the margins, I, I, I was shocked when I saw some of the, I know quite a few Subway people, and some of the margins, you know, that they're making, for what they pay for the franchise, I mean, it's, you're talking 125 grand minimum, I think it is. And, you know, and, and obviously they take out a, a percentage every month and, and so on. But, you know, some of them are only just about making a living, you know. And the, one of the reasons is because they just go anywhere. They'll stick them anywhere. Yeah. And, it, and it, unfortunately, you know, when you've got 900 node franchise brands, there, there are brands out there that, you know, I'm not going to name any names. I've been here too long, but there are well-established names. And I've met the franchisees and they said to me, oh, the minute they've got your money off you, they couldn't give a shit. You know, the support is absolutely crap. You know, you've yeah. just got to get out there and do it yourself. Yeah. And they're well-known well brands, some of them, you mm -hmm. know. One of, the, one of the problems, I know you're talking about franchising, but that's exactly the same as somebody wanted to start a business up without asking the questions that you and Mark are talking about. They're going to get nowhere. But the other thing is, there are so many people who don't know or don't want to know market research, footfall in the area, footfall with their own business, you know. And this has always frightened me, especially on those, uh, on those courses that I did uh, for the Chamber of Commerce. The people that came on them, they didn't really know what they wanted. You're quite right, Jeffrey, and a, and a lot of people go into franchise, this is why a lot of them fail. They go in with rose tinted specs. Yeah. You see, yeah. and then, oh, I like that, I could do that. I yeah. do it. And they yeah. don't do the proper research. Yeah. They I don't think... what they've got to do to be successful. You know, they think buying a brand. It, it, I remember meeting a guy from Prone to Print. We all know Prone to Print, don't we? One of the <laughs> longest published. And I'm going back a long time now. And we were talking about this roast into specs thing and he said Len he said they're the same with prompt to print he said they, they buy a prompt to print and they think the minute they put the prompt to print over the door everybody's going to walk in yeah. and it's not like that you still got to go and sell the product and sell the business yeah you know yeah. but there's so many that do that yeah Verna you know? had her finger up a couple of times I'm sure she wants yeah. to come and say something no um I just wanted to add in that that's the problem I found with businesses in general on the high street is they think they're just putting it there that's it and they close i've run into so many in east Dulwich who ended up closing around me in camberwell who ended up closing because they just weren't willing to do that extra bit of marketing just because their their business premises was on the high street they thought footfall mm -hmm. oh so frustrating yeah because they don't do the same I try to tell them that you need to invite people into your business constantly, like street signs, even mailers, drop off mailers, mailers work, email, hit them with mailers and email, digital, if they don't see you in digital, 
know, make sure they're seeing you because they don't always walk past you. But if they see your emails constantly, and I know this because that's how I am. In fact, if I want to remember your business, I look for where I can put my email on your website. That way you can email me and that way I won't forget you because there's so yeah. much going on out there. If you don't give people a way to remember you or stay in touch with you, then you lose mm. a customer because, you know, they move on. <laughs> I think one of the plan, sorry. No, all I was going to say is one of the problems at the present moment, there are too many yeah. people who work in the business and there are not enough who work on the business. Yeah. There is a humongous difference between in the business and on the business. I think sometimes franchisors sell something uh, to the potential franchisee who's looking for a solution. First of all, people are looking for a ready-made business or some business that they have an idea is going to be making them money. And when they then get sold, this idea of or this franchise is national, international, whatever it is, it's definitely going to work. You know, going to work. Uh, when you look at that franchise agreement, as you said earlier, Len, it's so biased towards the franchisor, and in some cases, actually limits the franchisee and many of the things that they uh, that they want to do. Uh, it's about finding and matching the right franchisee with the right franchisor. I think that that's really important. But I also think that there's a lot of businesses that shouldn't be franchised and they really just should be go out there. If, if once you understand how to do the business and that go out there and open your own and don't even bother with the franchise and immediately you're saving not only the upfront cost, but also that monthly ongoing cost. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Um, have, you, have you had situations where somebody's come to you wanting to franchise their business <clears throat> and either after talking to you or specifically because it was your advice, they've changed their mind and not franchised? And, and if so, what was the determining factor that made them not proceed? Yeah, I, I've, I've, had, <laughs> I've encountered both situations or every situation. Um, I, I've had franchise people come to me talking about franchising the business and I've advised them not to be, and they've gone ahead and done it. Most of them have failed. And I've also had, you know, franchise people come along uh, who I've advised not to franchise and they've not franchised. Um, it's a... It's a <laughs> You know, a good example is, is uh, uh, there's a lady around me from, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, there's a lady who rang me from Newcastle a couple of years ago, and it was in, it was in December, and she said, oh, I've got this business, and I, I, you know, I want to franchise it. And she was all excited on the phone, and she was like, and well, so I tapped in, got a website up. And um, I think it was a kid's day nursery or something like that. And she said, oh, I've got, you know, loads of people asking me, you know, I, I want to do this. I'd like to do this. So I want to franchise. So I said, how long have you been going? And she said, we started in January. And I said, so you've not even got 12 months of couch yet? And she said, well, no, no, but there are loads of people saying they can do it and they want to do it. And I just said, no. And I went through it with her and I said, you just cannot franchise your business. You know, the first... Somebody's going to fork out 10 grand to buy a franchise. The first thing they're going to ask you is, how soon can I get me 10 grand back? You know, how soon am I going to be in a profit? I, I, you know, uh, and so on. And, but, you know, I get that all the time. There, there are people out there who think, because people are excited about them, oh, I'd love to do this, I'd love to do this. But they go and do it. And if you look at, you touched on it before, um, I, I say there are roughly three but there's probably four types of people you've got the guy who none of you worked at the town hall have you because <laughs> I, I did i did for five years when i left school you've got the guy who's worked at the town hall and most of his life he gets made redundant he's 50 he gets a nice lump sum he doesn't want to retire so he goes and buys a franchise because he can't get a job anymore that guy normally when he gets to the level of earnings that he was earning at the town hall, he'll switch off. 
he can switch off because he's in his comfort zone, right? And they don't particularly make good franchisees. You've got the guy who, all, all female, you know, but either the person who's always wanted their own business, but for whatever reason, they've not come up with an idea or they've been married with three kids and, and you know, uh, so on and so on. Uh, they've never had the money. Suddenly they get in the 40s, the kids are growing up, they get divorced, the mum and dad leave them a load of money and they go and buy a franchise. Those people generally make good franchisees because they've always wanted their own business and they're motivated and, and they, 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 you know, they, they go out and do it. They've got the opportunity at last to do something that they wanted to do. Then you've got the other people who should never buy a franchisee in the first place. You know, they just like pie in the sky. On top of those three, you've got investors, like the guy who's got 26 costers. You know, he bought his first one, built it up, successful. And this is why now a lot, a lot of franchisors are encouraging franchisees to buy more than one outlet. People have got, you know, the one in Newton Willis, I think she's got six subways. Um, because it makes sense. If they've done well in one, then why not let them have another one? You know, and build up another one. So it's you've got these different types of people who, who, who come into franchising, and in some ways it makes it interesting. But you know, really, a lot of people we, we all know that I think one of the reasons franchising is successful in this country, and don't get me wrong, it's nowhere near as successful as Australia, and France, and, and, and America, but. The one reason it is successful when people go into it is that if you look at the statistics, and you will know the statistics um, for new businesses, startups, you know, roughly 45% of new businesses don't get past 18 months. They fail in the first 18 months. 80% don't get past five years. Yeah. Now, if you look at the statistics for franchising, it's totally the opposite. Totally the opposite, something like 90% of franchises are successful. So you can see why it's, it, it's classed as a good business model. Yeah. But it's not quite You've just taken uh, what I was going to mention with regard to businesses. 95% uh, in the first, in, in, the, in five years have gone when they've started up. And mm -hmm. I've always said, if you can get to the five year period, yeah. you've, you are then successful Mark would probably agree or disagree I'm not, with those figures, percentages. But basically, if a business gets beyond or up to the five-year period. I think one of the things that is noticeable with that is that with franchises, um, the franchisee is spoon-fed to a point in terms of, as you were saying before, Len, you buy the product from here you get X, Y, and Z from there. This is how you process things. These are the systems that you use. So they, they, they are being told how to do things all the way along in the, in the process. Yeah. When they're not a franchise or when it's a normal, their own business, they're running their own business, I think they're a lot more reluctant to invest. And it is, they're investing the money with the franchise or it's just not as visible, I guess. Yeah. But when they're running their own business, they end up, very reluctantly wanting to shell out that sort of money to say a consultant or an accountant to say, right, how do I get these processes in place? How do I ensure that everything works the way it should? And instead they try and do it themselves by the seat of their pants. Absolutely. And then they come to the accountant when things are going horribly wrong and say, right, help me. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 Sorry, Jeffrey. Can I just say in response to that, Mark, you're dead right. And, and, you know, those figures that we've talked about with, with people starting a business, I, I've started, you know, five different businesses over the years. I, I did accountancy for five years when I left school. I did finance when I left school. Now, the, the problem with starting a business, you've got, you've got the main, I don't care whether it's a franchise, whether it's a business, any business, you've got the same elements. You've got finance, you've got sales, you've got customers, you've got staff. You've got operations, right? And unless you've got those five working full speed, you're not going to have a good business. Mm. Now, I, I, you know, there's not many people that can do all those five things. 
And this is why a lot of new businesses, startup businesses fail, is because they're trying to do everything themselves. And it's like you said, they'll come to the accountant at the last minute. Yeah. When I started Same Day UK, one of the first things I did was appoint somebody to do the finances, right? Even though I've been in finance myself, you know, when I left school and all the rest of it, I put somebody in there to do the finances. Mm. Because, you know, I, I don't enjoy it. So I just, no, I'll go out and do the sales. You know, I'm good at sales. And so I'll go out and do the sales. Yeah. And, and this is where a lot of people fail. They start a business, they can only afford probably to employ one, one member of staff or something like that when they first start. And they just haven't got the resources. And because you're charging them so much or the solicitor charging them so much, they won't use them. They'll yeah. wait and wait until the last minute. Yeah. And, and this is why a lot of them come and stop because they don't take the advice. They don't, you know, they don't do it in, in the proper way. They try and do everything themselves. Yeah. You, you, you and Mark have just actually taken what I was going to say a few minutes ago completely out of um, me. The, the thing that I've found is that people will not, when they've started their business off, seek advice. Reason? They feel they failed. They feel if they've gone and asked for it or they go to ask for advice, whether it's from a consultant, a mentor, an accountant, a solicitor, they feel that they feel ashamed mm. and that is one of the problems we've got and i think we are all going to come across these over the next six to twelve months in a big way because there are a lot of people out there that will not change yep they'll be doing things the way they did before covid took over they are doing things now which is nothing. They're not planning for mm. the next six, 12, 18, five years in some cases. And one of the things that's got me a little upset and hot under the collar is the way people are saying with regard to getting back to where we were. And I personally think with the support, the help, the guidance, the money that the government is throwing into small businesses, into businesses, big businesses, the lot, this is unprecedented when you think of the failures that have taken place over the last 40 odd years because of recessions, because of one thing and another. We are in a unique position at the moment, all of us, to bluntly make a little bit of brass ourselves. Yep. Because we all know what we're talking about. Yep. But what we don't, what, what is <coughs> difficult is going to educate those people you know excuse me saying it but mark i'm sure that you must know at least five maybe ten percent of your people your, your your clients rather who you feel couldn't really need help at the moment but mm -hmm. are too ashamed to ask for it and this is the sad part and i don't know whether it's the english culture or not <laughs> And I'm sure it is. We don't like asking for help. I have thought of working with American clients from here as opposed to British clients. <laughs> like, because over there they understand that you can't really have a business and not market it. Most people get that. Like over here, it's just pulling teeth. <laughs> you know? And I'm nice and kind about it, you know? I, but it's pulling teeth. You know, I've seen businesses. One of my favorite places called Sugar. It was a clothing store. It was amazing. And they closed down. They closed down. Oh, my God. So, so much. I was like, Instagram. Come on, Instagram. Facebook ads that it wouldn't even cost that much. But no, they just didn't quite do it. And next thing you know, they were closed. Yeah. They were an amazing store. Like, everyone I would take there would buy something. Yeah. You, when? You've got to change, right? And Borders and Amazon is a prime example. Or you look at Kodak or, or you know, companies like that. Uh, but one of the, or two of the first things that people stop as soon as they get into the more difficult times is training and marketing. Yep. Yep. I mean, I'm having yep. people cancel left, right and center for courses. Excuse me, guys. Uh, cheers, Mark. <laughs> Mark. Uh, having people cancel left, right, and center, you know, for, for, for courses and that coming up. But that's, again, looking at doing it in a different way then. So 
putting on workshops, doing the online courses, doing group coaching, rather masterminds, etc. Mm-hmm. I think on one side, it's yeah, people are uh, reluctant to ask for help because they have this idea of I oh, know then maybe they failed. But in the other side, there's and that question that, you know, Len asks, are you prepared to give up some of your control? Uh, it's one of the most difficult things for most business people to do is to go and give up that control because it's their baby, their thing. They want to do everything, right? About five years ago, I was called into a business over in Liverpool. The business was 40 odd, 50 years old. And the person who owned the business sold it off to a couple of his employees. And the employees who'd been with him for a long time, they were in the SH1T. They called me in. I gave them a figure of what I would do to help them out, to sort them out and do the best I could. They owned their own property, building the works, 20 odd employees. One of the first things I had to do was to actually say to them, right, you need to cut down your wages for one thing. You need to look at your staff because as far as I've seen over the last week that I've been in here, they're all talking. They're not working as much as they could be. And then what horrified me, and I had just been diagnosed with my leukemia in the middle of this. She said, oh, I'm going to Bangkok for a couple of weeks, Jeffrey. Can you look after the business? And in the, while she was over there, I was up in Newcastle. Uh, it was in the April time with my family. We were all staying in a cottage, the whole family. And she contacted me to say, Jeffrey, I need some money urgently because I can't, I can't do this. I can't do the other. I ended up having to send money across myself out of my account. And when she got back, she just wouldn't still face the fact that I, I'd said to her, I've got rid of half your staff. I've put them, you have know, sacked them. She went absolutely bazuntine. I'll leave it at that. But that is a typical example of people who will not listen to you. We've all got to face the facts. We can all help everybody at the moment. So we've got to push these little talks we're having as we're doing out to, to all the people that we know. And I would like just to round the meeting off because we're, we're well over the hour. 